as soon as possible. Yes. Well, speaking of news on the internet, we had some news break on Wednesday, and I'm going to read from Bloomberg. They write, OpenAI will acquire the AI device startup co-founded by Apple veteran Johnny Ive in a nearly $6.5 billion all-stock deal, joining forces with the legendary designer to make a push into hardware. The purchase, the largest in OpenAI's history, will provide the company with a dedicated unit for developing AI-powered devices. Acquiring the secretive startup named IO, in all lowercase, also will secure the services of Ive and other former Apple designers who were behind iconic products such as the iPhone. Quote, I have a growing sense that everything I've learned over the last 30 years has led me to this place and to this moment, I've said in a joint interview with OpenAI Chief Executive Officer Sam Altman. It's a relationship and a way of working together that I think is going to yield products and products and products. So Ben, there have been rumors surrounding this partnership for a good two years now. What do you think of the news that emerged on Wednesday? I mean, it's certainly a, a big deal. I mean, the you know, it, it's pretty interesting. I didn't know that this announcement, I, I think it's been reported that they're working together. Like mm -hmm. maybe, uh, what's the line between rumor and like we, everyone kind of knows this to be true. But there have been drips and drabs for about a year and a half. Right. But I, I one thing that has been a hang up for me has been this concept of how do you do a partnership for building this product? An acquisition makes a lot more sense. This is now mm -hmm. sort of an open AI company. There is, by the way. Uh, OpenAI is in this weird transition from a nonprofit to a for-profit with the nonprofit board still in control. Uh, a good way to uh, diminish the amount of stock that in the final transaction goes to the nonprofit is to be handing out stock willy-nilly for entities mm. like Windsurf and for, for IO. But both products, we talked about Windsurf last week, fit the general thesis of OpenAI seeking to be the interface for AI. And, yeah. you know, I, it was totally by chance that I wrote this yesterday in the context of Google IO. One of my takeaways, and I know we'll get to Google IO later, but this, it was overwhelming in many respects, all the stuff that they showed. And a mm -hmm. lot of it's like, how are customers actually going to use this and get to this? Like there's sort of these fanciful demos that we speak positively of like, oh, AI is amazing if you take agency, and a lot of them are like, no one's going to actually do this. And, right. and one of my one of my takeaways was actually this is reinforcing to me why for consumer companies the hardware layer is so important. You it's need a, a product that makes it easy and ties it all together. That's that right. right. And it was yeah. very tangible. You go to the store, you buy this thing, this thing lets you do things. The mm -hmm. idea, like, like, and that's part of what makes ChatGPT pretty incredible. Actually, is the fact. For most consumers, or it started out as a website, it's a website, and then yeah. like an app to build that way is actually it's weird because it feels easier because hey, it's just an app, you right? It's just a website, it's just code. But in many respects, it's actually much more difficult than getting in twenty twenty five. It's unbelievable that that there are this many people typing ChatGPT.com into their browser and right. accessing it that way. Yeah. Oh, that was another uh, uh, OpenAI deal. They bought Chat.com ages ago, and then I think they realized, no, we got to stick with ChatGPT. That is the brand. But if you mm -hmm. type Chat.com, you will go to ChatGPT.com. Uh, but the yeah, so it makes if this is going to be a consumer tech company, which I think it clearly is going to be. Uh, this makes sense in a certain dimension. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is this eternal tension between being a hardware company versus being a services company. And I've talked about this for years and years in Stratechery. Again, to, to go back to Google, where I think they erred, and I think Google itself realizes they erred, and again, we're repeating ourselves. Uh, well, I guess this is a good sign. I think we've been on the right path. But when they were focused on differentiating Android from the iPhone. Right. And the reality is they also needed to serve iPhone customers. And so here's the question. Is this a case where, is this a distraction? They actually need to be a service that's 
on other devices. They have this partnership with Apple. Is that more in the direction of where they're going? And this is a sort of a, a, a signal of direction in a, no, we're going to be fully integrated. You're going to come to us for everything. And well, that's actually, what I'm wondering, are they not picking a direction here? Because if you step back, it sort of looks like they're trying to become Google and Apple in one company. And I don't know whether that's a bad thing. I mean, I guess for now, as we all wait to see what this technology turns into and how people are accessing it, maybe it makes sense to keep all your options open. But I wonder whether there are drawbacks to this approach. Well, let's think about the hardware layer. To the, it's always been the case that when you think about the hardware layer, there's like Apple over there and Apple does what they do and you're not going to compete with them and you're not going to get their customers because they love Apple. And mm -hmm. so it's like, what do you do outside of that? And you think about this in the context of like Meta, right? Meta's sort of like, there's sort of an assumption Apple is going to be there, but you know, Mark Zuckerberg has said explicitly, we want to be the Android to Apple and in, embedded in that is the assumption that Apple's going to have a headset and it's going to be compelling and they're going to have their customers and sure Facebook will be on there but realistically there's also going to be an alternative to be a, a, a quote unquote open platform and that's the opportunity that we're going to seize if you're open AI though and you're sort of looking forward setting aside th this is sort of a, a statement in many respects that we know Google's going to be there. And mm. I think Google I.O. was a good articulation of that. The fact of the matter is the reason why Google's always been such an interesting player when it comes to AI is the business model challenges are obvious, but equally obvious is their infrastructure is unmatched. They have the best team. You go back to the original OpenAI founding and those emails between Elon Musk and Sam Altman basically saying, look, Google is going to take this oh, whole yeah. thing unless someone sort of steps up now. And you can definitely see a world in which Sam Altman is sitting there. Uh, you say what you will about Sam Altman. Uh, he is very good in terms of thinking in systems and structured thinking about what's going to happen in the future. And looking forward and saying, the opportunity is to be the Apple of this space. They're mm -hmm. not going to be anywhere. Google is going to be there. Do we want to compete with them head on or do we want to assume they're going to be in the market? Android's going to be deeply integrated with their models. We're just going to be an app on Android, just like Meta complains about just being an app on iOS. Yeah. And if we want to fully compete and deliver an experience, and by the way, maybe we do think there's going to be significant costs to AI on a marginal basis. It's not, is it ever going to get to the cost structure of web services where you basically treat every user servicing them as free, even though, even though the costs are astronomical, but you, that's how you operate. And actually the opportunity is to be the integrated all up hardware player winner. Yeah. Hardware winner. We, right. Ex exactly. Well, and, and this seems, you know, that that's how I would be thinking about this. Yeah, and it's a good callback to those emails about Google eight years ago when they were just starting out. And the other thing that amused me with this news on Wednesday, we've joked about this at various points over the last two years, but there's now a long running tradition of OpenAI timing its biggest announcements to upstage Google. And this appears to it be- literally, It literally be called IO, the week it's of so Google IO. <laughs> it's so good across the board. Last year, I believe it was I mean, did they AI name it IO like a mode. long time ago, just in anticipation of this week? I mean, it, it, it really it could is. Be. It could uh, be, they've been talking for a while according to the nine minute video I watched, which we could get to. Um... Well, the other thing, the other thing about this is Johnny Ive is the headliner. And I, I, I can't remember if I said on this podcast, I definitely said it uh, on dithering this. You go back to that interview Johnny Ive did with Patrick Collison a, a week or two ago, a great interview, mm -hmm. definitely worth watching. Uh, one of the all time condemnations of sports analytics without mentioning sports analytics, um, yep. which, which, which I appreciated. But what came across is, He's locked in. He's a live player. This is, this wasn't an elder statesman sort of looking back at his career and reflecting on where they're at. And probably the most interesting bit here, and it came across in this 10-minute video, which we will get to, <laughs> was the real angst he felt about the smartphone. 
and yeah. this sense that I created this monster <laughs> that I'm not sure it's good and I want to go in and fix things. And so that's the Johnny Ive angle. But what has perked up my ears and I think other Apple observers is it's one thing if it's Johnny Ive, rich beyond belief, uber successful, the ultimate made man dinking around in San Francisco, making the King's crest and Oh, now levels of what would a hardware device look like? Yeah. I mean, I saw what, like a year or two back, he designed a $2,500 coat for Montclair. So that's sort of what I assumed he had been doing for the last several years. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm more of a can of, can of goose man myself, unless I go to Washington <laughs> DC, but yes, uh, yeah. the, uh, so just uh, like fun side projects for a guy who's rich and has nothing left to prove. Right. No, exactly. But, what has happened over the last couple of years is the talent they are taking from Apple has been pretty extraordinary. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so, so not, uh, Evans Hankey is, is a very well, she's the one who succeeded Johnny. And then she left a couple of years later. And then also uh, um, the, like the head of design for the iPhone. Like, so there's different, there's the actual like industrial design and like figuring out, and then there's the actual like design for manufacturing and yep. then, and, and operations all these well there's like this middle piece where you're you're bringing those two parts together but then they're also hiring operations people so like this has been and everything you hear is they know everyone at apple they know everyone that's good and they have been running quite the operation for the last few months in particular but over the last year or two to basically say who are the people at Apple that we know are excellent and we're going to go get them. And mm -hmm. this is very much an Apple operation in that it is Apple people. Now that could be a plus and a minus, right? It, it's people who've already succeeded, who maybe don't have the fire in the belly, you know, whether that comes from, right. you know, that's Johnny Ive circa 1995. On the other hand, they're very good at what they do <laughs> and they know what they're doing. This isn't a fly by night hardware operation, picking up the scraps. They've gone into Apple and they have plucked the best people. 